I feel like I don't want to fan. I'd rather be the one who's worshipped. Worshipped or blamed. I think at the end of the day, probably both. I wrote The Eighth Doctor, played by Paul McGann. It's a bit of a responsibility, I think, that we have. You know, stories are powerful. Mythologies are powerful. My job was to write a TV movie pilot with the hope that it would spawn a new American Doctor Who series. They are the diehards. There's a whole community of people that do this. They love this thing that society says you shouldn't love as much as you do. I didn't go to conventions for a very good reason. Be nice. I thought the fans would kill me. The doctor being half human. Please punch me in the face. People universally went after the script. I got physically assaulted by someone who was so angry at the idea that the doctor would kiss. No sex, please. He's Matthew Jacobs. My father was an actor. He was in an early Doctor Who adventure called The Gunfighters. It'd be fantastic on The Gunfighters, because you're going to go back to your boyhood memories. I really don't want to do The Gunfighters panel. It's freaking me out. I was pouring myself into that character. I got so close. And then I got left behind. Maybe I'm regenerating. Doctor Who has helped a lot of people find who they are. This is a giant family, and it's full of love. Woo! The sense of community and companionship. That's what I enjoy the most about it. You go for the fans. You're a part of this now. I think at the end of the day, I'm a bigger fan than I knew. At some point or other in our lives, we all ask the same question. Who am I? My name is Christian Basil. Years ago, I had an idea. I got myself a TARDIS, took it to new places, met a lot of new people, took some great pictures, and talked Doctor Who. From Krypton Radio and the creators of the Hanging With web show, this is the legend of the traveling TARDIS. Join me on my latest adventures and become part of the legend.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to another edition of The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. My name is Christian Basil. I am the showrunner and host of this adventure. And today we've got two special guests today. Uh, our good friend, you may be familiar with him. Hey, Alicia, how you doing? Happy Tuesday. And Ramona, how you doing there? Everybody's saying hello in the chats out there. Please make sure you are chatting. Have your questions ready because tonight's special guest, we are having Matthew Jacobs, better known as the co-producer and writer of the 1996 Doctor Who TV movie starring Paul McGann, Eric Roberts, and Daphne Ashbrook and Yi Ji Cho, and uh, better known as the Fox Tuesday Night Movie. Hey, Mark Robinson. Hello, Mackenzie. Thank you up there. And uh, we got we finally got you connected. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you so much, Mackenzie. Thank you and in, enjoy. Folks, thank you for joining us tonight. We have our special guests, Matthew Jacobs and Vanessa Yule. They are the directors. And if I'm not mistaken, and just correct me if I'm wrong, Jacob, you're both the directors and the co-producers of uh, this uh, documentary that's come out, Doctor Who Am I? Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. All righty. Well, it's been a while, Jake, Matthew, since we've had you on there, and you can check out all of Matthew's, uh, check out uh, the upcoming documentary that will be released, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the end of March, DrWhoAmI.com. That's DrWhoAmI.com for our friends who are listening on uh, iHeartRadio and our audio podcast, Spotify, Spreaker, everything out there. Thank you for joining us today. We've got not only an all-star panel but a very packed panel. So let me go ahead and drop the banner. Uh, first of all, let's go ahead and start off with Dave himself. Dave, my good friend, the rat hole. Howdy, howdy. How you doing there, Dave? Thank you so much. I'm doing absolutely fabulous. Uh, so excited to be here. I was, I was sad that we had to postpone last week. No, that's fine. Even like kind of did some good beating up on uh, worlds apart, but you know, I st still, <sighs> Oh, it's it's been been worlds apart. Yeah, we've, we've gotten yeah, a little we've... practice in, and I had a royal beating on last Tuesday. So, yeah, speaking, speaking of a royal beating, well, there's Mark Muncy. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing there, Mark? Let me go ahead and unmute your microphone. How's it going there, Mark? Uh, doing Florida. great. Thanks for playing that well that way. So, <laughs> I'm getting yeah, better at my fun, little so. segways now. Rubber Ducky, how you doing, Rubber Ducky? Oh, I'll man, everybody's out there, there today. So yeah, we've good got to be a... back, and what what a great show to be on for. I, I, I'm a, I'm one of the, the unapologetic fans of the movie. So. Gotcha. And uh, the documentary is amazing. So. It is. Uh, we will be going uh, deeply deeper into it. And speaking of amazing, Mr. Simon Fisher-Becker, how you doing there? Fisherbecker.com, how you doing? Yeah. Hello, and uh, happy Tuesday to everyone. Yes, yeah, very excited to be here this week, uh, and uh, I'm always excited. It's a wonderful show, and it's always a wonderful subject to talk about. So, you know, <laughs> that's right. Don't forget on Cameo, Cameo.com slash Ficker. <laughs> wow, it's been a late Tuesday. Cameo.com slash Fisher Becker one. Is that correct? Did I get that right, sir? I think so. Yes. Awesome. Just type in my name. That should be uh, all right. And believe it or not, um, Melanie tonight will be handling your chats. So make sure that you're going to be, uh, if you're chatting, Melanie's going to be taking care of things backstage. Yep, she's taking the producer's chair. So welcome there. And definitely, whoop, hold on there. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and let's go ahead and introduce our special guest today. First of all, ladies first, we're going to introduce you to Miss Vanessa Yule who is one of the directors and co-producers of this uh, documentary. Vanessa, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And it's a pleasure to be a first timer on the show. Awesome. Is this your first, I'm, I'm assuming it's not your first podcast for first interview, it, correct? It's not my first podcast, but we haven't done many. Well, I guess this is sort of North America based podcast. We haven't done many. We've done some in the UK, but maybe like uh -huh. my second time using this format. Oh, okay, cool. Are you familiar with StreamYard and all of its glory? Mm, not all of its glory, but still learning. But it's definitely like, ooh, interesting. Yeah, we're, yeah, it's got a lot of things going for it out there. And plus, we are broadcasting all of our, on our social media, as you can see on the bottom of the screen, uh, youtube.com uh, slash The Legend of the Traveling Cardist. Don't forget to subscribe. Super chats and super thanks are always welcome. That's right, Vanessa. You show them. You show them there. <laughs> Speaking of showing them, let's go ahead and bring in our very special guest, the man who created the 1996 TV movie, 
who brought us your eighth doctor, who brought us everything that we're going to be talking about tonight. And then he's bringing us our documentary. His documentary is going to be coming out, premiering at the end of March. How are you doing, Matthew? Thank you, Matthew Jacobs. I'm doing really well. And it's a real honor to be here. Thank you for inviting us. I mean, oh, this thank is great. Thank you for coming. I was, uh, I, I came around and we're Facebook friends. And I noticed there was like this documentary you were bringing out there, there, Doctor Who, Who Am I? And we wanted to know something about that. But first, talk to us a little bit about that documentary. Where, where did you get the title for that? And I know where it comes from because yeah. we, uh, I've seen the documentary. <laughs> yeah. But tell us wh wh where, why you named it Doctor Who Am I? I think we called it Doctor Who Am I because that was the pitch that I made to get the 96 Doctor um, Who TV movie to get you know for, for my script and that was very much the story of the tv movie um just somebody searching for their own identity and uh when we um you know and and the inception of the of the uh you know most documentaries are born out of a sort of ambition to sort of cover a, a particular subject but in some ways ours was born out of our friendship um uh, vanessa and i have been working together on a couple of movies and um and we, you t i mean you could tell them vanessa because it was really just as much vanessa's idea as mine in fact probably more so i was sort of dragged into this i think <laughs> and and the title doctor who am i was just a knee-jerk reaction of yes if we're going to go off and explore the world of american fandom it should be about identity it should be about this um, but, but really, I think Vanessa tells it best how the whole thing came to pass. Really, Vanessa, tell us a little bit about that and that title. That this well, I was um, meeting Matthew for, is that the end of December? I mean, it's been a long time. It's taken a long time to make this documentary. We started filming in February 2015. Um, and it's just been, you know, we're just, been going at it and we're so thrilled that people are finally going to be able to see it or in the UK they have been able to see it and that people in the US will be able to um, but it was at the end of 2014 I was visiting Matthew uh, I was in town for a job at the end of the year and it was sort of a bet it was um, a, a friends meeting up because um, you know I've worked with Matthew and a couple of his features previously and mm -hmm. we're friends and um, it was after my father had passed away and we were, you know, over a cup of coffee and just telling him about that and lightening the mood. He started telling me about these uh, conventions that he was getting invited to, like in, where, where was it? Sarasota? Florida. No, in Florida. It was in Gainesville. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Somewhere in Florida. Mm -hmm. It was just like, oh, this could be hilarious having Matthew. Because I didn't want to go. No, he didn't want to go. He was just okay, like, David Tennant. Yeah, <laughs> Well, it oh wasn't that. It was just that like everybody. We. It's just I had this fear of the whole thing, really, which was ungrounded, um, uh, and you know, well, you it wasn't. Yeah. Well, it was just this idea. First of all, Matthew in Florida seems kind of funny. I love Matthew. He's just hilarious, and him like wrestling with alligators and crocodiles, and you know, he's headlining this show. I mean, you can tell more about the show, but I'm like, you know crying like laughing as i'm hearing all about this um because i also didn't realize that matthew wrote the tv movie i didn't really know about the tv movie and so i was like why are you going invited why are you being invited to doctor who conventions this is bizarre and um, oh, i wish i had that problem Where <laughs> <laughs> i was just like this is so random i'm like what you're, you're Fl florida doctor who like matthew what um, because of, out of all the things that he talked about, he never mentioned the TV movie and I'd never seen it, but I knew Tom Baker from when it was on, um, mm -hmm. public, uh, broadcast PBS and, um, <coughs> watching it with my dad. So it's very nostalgic. Um, but so my mind was just being blown. I didn't know the controversy behind the TV movie that, you know, Oh, the doctor kisses his companion. Oh, he's half human. Um, so out of all of this, this like this would make a great documentary. We need to film this. This is going to be a train wreck. Let's film this train wreck. And, you know, and he's my friend. So it'll, it'll be a fun journey for the both of us. 
And I'd been invited because what had happened is that's very good. I mean, I'd been invited to this strange convention, um, and and because it was run by someone who was a little, um, well, I should say crooked, really. He set it up and then he cancelled it. This was way back in like 2015, and he cancelled it and run off with the money, and oh. so suddenly it was all over I the internet. Was there too. Where's this um, in Florida? It was in Florida. I think it was oh, in yeah. Florida, um, and I remember that and uh, and it was a very it was it was it was all over the internet. And so as a result, Sean Sean Lyon of of Gallifrey contacted me and said, well, "Would you want to go to a real con come to a real convention?" We didn't even realize you were here in America, Matthew. Um, so so um, so and normally the conventions don't really write uh, bring in writers. It's normally about the actors. So so. I said yes, absolutely. But as long as you give us, you know, permission to film and and um, and some rooms, you know, so that ooh, I can bring a crew. Um, and, <laughs> and he went, oh, okay, um, and, he, and that became the sort of deal. And we did that at Gallifrey, and we did that at Long Island, and then we went into people's homes, and bit by bit, we found what the story was really going to be about, which is which is about how I go from um, not really being a fan in many ways, even though I wrote the show, um, uh, to, to becoming a fan and joining this family. That's why the tagline on the um, American poster is a family that's bigger on the inside. And I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's been a fantastic journey for both of us. And it's been like, you know, eight, nine years now. Um, of slowly building this journey into fandom, and it's gone down well in in the UK, um, where fans have been fascinated to see how American fandom works, um, and they feel yeah, very it's much. It's a different seen. religion, so I've been told altogether. Yeah, <laughs> it's yes, a completely different religion. I'm going to hold you right there, Matthew, because we're going to get to commercial break. When we return, we're going to continue our discussion with Matthew Jacobs and Vanessa Yule of Doctor. Who am I? When we return, please continue to stay logged on, tuned in, and become part of the legend. We'll be right back. Shut up. I know I hit the wrong button. Shut up. <laughs> oh, Chris. Me. Me, the doctor. I'm the doctor. But not the one you were expecting. All right, sexy. It's time to go home. Doctor Who Velocity, streaming now. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Legend of the Traveling TARDIS. My name is Christian Basil. We have our two special guests tonight. We have the lovely Vanessa Yule, and we also have the lovely Matthew Jacobs, who made a documentary called Doctor Who Am I? And we're continuing our uh, discussions. Please make sure you go into the chat. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're getting close. We're getting very, very close to uh, 3,000, uh, hopefully, by before the end of this year there. Mackenzie says, we know Christian can never pass the right... Shh. Get her up. Get... Not only get her off. <laughs> get her off. <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. Everybody's criticizing me because I hit the wrong button again. I know. I know. Sure. Always. 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 Yeah, this is this is especially a when we have guests. We really are professionals. Yeah, especially yeah, when, when we, have we have guests. guests. It's, it's always when we have guests. <laughs> so uh, thank you for joining us. We're discussing yeah, about race. Matthew Jacobs and the TV movie. Matthew, um, so where did you get the gig from? How did everything get started uh, with the TV movie? How did that all come to pass? That was... Um... I, I'd been I'd been writing um, for what's so funny? I'm sorry, Matthew. Oh, we sorry, we got a super chat. Somebody spent five bucks to make sure that I knew that I hit the wrong button. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Matthew, go ahead and continue. I'm okay. so sorry. Oh, I I I'd been writing for Young Indiana Jones, so so oh. um, uh, and I'd also done a lot of work for the BBC, and when the project went to Fox. Um, uh, um, cause they'd been trying to set it up as a series when, and when that didn't happen and it went to Fox, um, to be a movie of the week, the head of the TV movie division, there was a guy called Trevor Walton and he knew my work very well. And when he suggested me, I think everybody was on board because everybody I'd worked with most of the people who were involved and there were a lot of people involved. So, so it was Universal, it was BBC, it was Ambling. Ambling had done, um, had done Young Indy, even though they didn't end up on the final thing. They were involved for a while prior to me coming on board. So, so everybody knew of my work. So as, so as a result, um, they came to my agent at ICM, um, Cindy Mintz, and Cindy Mintz contacted me and said, would I like to you know, go in and pitch? And so I went in and pitched, and my pitch was, um, well, Doctor Who am I? You know, it's, it's, we'll see the regeneration, and we'll go. You know, and I basically pitched what you end up seeing, um, and so it was for me. It was quite a quick process, even though they'd been doing it for years, um, and uh, and the, the script happened quite quickly. So it was very conventional. I, I basically got the job from my agent. Now, I remember something. There were two controversial bits about the movie, about the TV movie. And if, if you all come about dressing them, I know you dress them in the movie, but I don't want to give too many spoilers, but we already know about the issues. One of them, I really, you see, we didn't have Twitter or any of these, these things that we communicate with, Facebook, all those guys out here, like we do now, as you can see here. Yeah. And um, one of the things that hit home with me was, your reasoning for using the doctor being half human. And unfortunately I felt the same way when I first heard it. Oh my God, it's Spock. And yes, that's, you, see, I that... wasn't, you see, I was just, um, I suppose I was ignorant of that because I wasn't really a follower of Star Trek. And so um, when, when they, when the fans point that out to me in the, um, in the movie, uh, I'm taken by surprise. Uh, probably subconsciously, I was ripping off Star Trek, um, and uh, it was just careless, I suppose, um, in that respect. But but we it never worried Philip Siegel at all. And I've always felt as though, to be honest, I've always felt there's this, there is a special affinity between the Doctor and and humans. It, it's just. It, most of the stories are about humans and about the about Earth. Why is he so attached to Earth? Um, and it seemed to make sense to me. But if you don't mind me, I don't want to give too many spoilers. Yeah. But would would you mind revealing as to why you pick that uh, that device as far as the Doctor being half human? Um, I or... I, just, I just I think it just made him more. I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I, I can't remember. Um, it felt like the right thing to do. Um, it really did. Does that sound stupid? It probably does. No, it doesn't. Uh, it had. Well, I like I said, I don't want to give too much away, but it had to do with religion. If it, <sighs> don't mind me, in. that's oh. why I was like, wow. If I had known this. Oh, uh, half human on his on his on his mother's side. Mother's side. Well, yeah. that was that was the that was kind of a joke. Um, uh, you know how, like, if you're when you're not really, people say that you're not really Jewish um, unless your mother is Jewish, um, and so it's a thing people say. And actually, we made a whole other movie that kind of referred to that, which is your good friend, um, which is so. 
So that was very much on my mind. Um, so in a way, um, uh, yes, yes, we talk about that. It's a, it's a funny thing in the, in the documentary, isn't it, Vanessa? I, 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 I don't know why I say that. Why, why do you think that That's came up, Vanessa? That why the doctor was half human? Yes. Well, I think the one we've talked about it is just because the doctor always is saving Earth. And so it just yes. sort of makes sense that why does he love humans so much? Oh, because he's one of them. But why did we talk about the half Jewish thing in the, in the documentary? I can't remember how that came up. It was at a because your dad is uh, half. Oh uh, yes, he's Jewish. Yes. Yeah. So that's why we kind of bring it up. Yes, I think that's what. That, yes, there we are. That's me being very Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I got on the bus the other day. There was a kind of a strange guy. There's a lot of anti-Semitism in this country at the moment. Oh, yeah. It's a bit scary. A lot of isms. For a lot sure. of, yeah, there's a lot of yeah, isms everywhere. Simon, you think, got a question? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, uh, my now my I'm I'm a fan of the movie, and uh, one of the reasons I'm a fan of the movie is you brought back mm. the great Doctor Villain, uh, the Master. You know his, right. his Moriarty to his Sherlock. So um, when you had, you know, there's, there they are right there. So um, <laughs> have, having fun writing for them. Yeah. I know um, Eric Roberts was cast after you wrote it. Did, how mm -hmm. much fun did you have writing the villain? I mean, that's always my favorite part. of writing. Oh, it's, it's such fun. And the master's wonderful because I mean, the thing about writing villains is, is a, a villain has to be his own hero. He has to, you know, under, he has to, he has to understand why he's doing stuff. Um, and with the master, um, he, he not only understands that, but he also enjoys um, being who he is. And that's my feeling in all the incarnations mm -hmm. of the master. It always works best when the person who's playing it um, enjoys who he is. Um, so there's that sort of confidence there. And I have a question, why Eric Roberts? What made you pick him? Because he goes really outside the green. He's a, he's an American actor, um, completely different than what we normally would have seen for the master. Well, we wanted to have a British doctor, and so it became uh, it became a trade off really. Um, uh, Fox needed an American name, and Eric Roberts does have a following and is well known in America. Um, so so we had to cast really an American star in that role. And so various names were put forward and Eric had had um, been had gone to drama school at RADA in London and uh, um, he was very familiar or was familiar with Doctor Who as a show. And he also had, he, so he responded to the script. Um, and I wrote a lot more kind of stuff for him, which we kept on pairing back. Um, but uh, but he was he was um, tremendously game and uh, enjoyed it a lot. I mean, what what do you think about Eric Vanessa? What was well? I mean, I thought he was great. Yeah, I saw the movie after we talked, so it was in 2015. It was the first time that I saw the movie. It was before I even then jumped into the new series. So in a way, you know, I guess. Paul McGann is my second doctor that I, I love a lot. There's Tom Baker, and then, then Paul McGann, and then, of course, Christopher Eccleston, my first. Um, but I thought it was great. I thought the movie was fun. I didn't see why anyone would be up in arms about it. I thought, you know, the that Eric Roberts was hilarious. Lots There were lots of great one-liners, and I just thought it was an enjoyable movie. So I didn't... I, I thought he was, it was great to be cast. I love Eric Roberts. I just think he brings something to it. So I, I was biased, I thought. We have a, uh, a question in the chats. Uh, um, this guy, uh, this is Tom Kosak, better known as the hashtag guru. Rebs, ra Rebs raves and rants. What was the concept <laughs> of the master's eyes? <laughs> oh, he had to wear those. Well, if it, in, in the TV movie, basically, the master has been reduced to a blob of slime that's contained in a casket. Um, uh, 
the abyss. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, 90s CG. Oh, they're so excited about kind of doing like lobby things. How charming. That's right. So, so, so he, so when we see the, the, the slime, as it were, um, that is, that, that is the master manifest itself. It manifests itself. It carries itself in the, um, ambulance driver's, uh, costume, you know, back to the, back to, uh, Bruce's place. Um, and, and, uh, you see it come out briefly and it manifests itself as kind of like a snake. And then the snake leaps into Bruce's snoring mouth and basically possesses him from inside. So he has these reptile-like eyes. That was the idea there, um, that, that there was something um, that was definitely not human that was controlling um, Bruce's body. Um, it was all a bit, all, all good fun. <laughs> And and then and uh, I, I snore, so that was that was why um, I was snoring. I, I'm sure Eliza was happy that you you shut up Eric from snoring. <laughs> 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 I'm sure she enjoyed that before her death scene. In there. That's right. Uh, we're gonna. Be, oh, go ahead, Vanessa. I'm sorry. But then there was kind of like a homage to Terminator. It seemed. Yes, yes, oh. definitely. Yes, with the yeah. with the Mac. I mean, the they they kind of. I mean, Terminator owes a lot as well to to other stuff. So, but but definitely, it it, it was nineties, and and he was going around with this body. You know, he was having enormous fun with that, and he makes this sort of magical appearance in the TARDIS, um, and uh, he somehow he gets into the TARDIS ahead of um, Yiji, um, which which is which which is a sort of a. I, you know, there's a there's a lot of loose ends, I think, with with um, with the master. There's a lot of Maybe loose ends with the master. Yeah, there's a lot of loose ends yeah. with the master. Where we just normally say, "Well, that's the master." Simon, I know you got a question, <laughs> and then we're going to go to commercial break. Simon, what's your question for us? Uh, just a very quick question: What was the process of actually choosing Paul McGann? Oh, um, yeah. In, in Paul, America, Paul. There's so many English yes already out there. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I mean, Paul McGann was brilliant. Uh, yeah, no, Paul would all, would all, now he's utterly delightful. He is. He was he was he was someone who Philip Siegel had had his eye on to play the doctor when they were developing it as a series um at Universal. And um so Paul had already done an audition prior to I think even prior to me starting on the on the feature script. So they'd already decided that he had exactly that right sort of blend of uh, sort of, he, he, he sort of brought together a lot of the things that up until that point we'd come to expect from the Doctor. He was, um, he was dashing and he was funny and he, and he was, uh, you know, and he wasn't, and he was also um, was he like a man of the people, you know, that kind of thing. And, and I think there was a lot of things that Philip really liked about him. Um, so really early on, they were saying to me, this is Paul McGann, and we're going to fight for Paul. And they did. Now, if I'm not mistaken, didn't Capaldi audition for the role as well? Did I hear that right? Yeah, that he audition? might have done. I, he wouldn't, I wouldn't have seen his audition. Um, oh, okay. but, um, but it was, um, um, he, you know, it was already, Paul was on board before, I think, May have been before, definitely before Jeffrey Sachs came on board. When Jeffrey came on board, then we got into casting Grace and we got into casting the supporting roles. Um, and uh, um, it's casting these shows is it's a it's a very sort of slow process, Simon. You know, you, you know this. It's a it's a kind of a it's a it's a sort of it's, and it's a question of trading this thing, finding the right chemistry. Um, the reasons why somebody is cast um, is, uh, is it's a mystery to me. And I act. I'm an actor too, and I never understand. And so is Vanessa. And we, we you know, we both go up for for roles and things and, and do do quite a lot of work. But um, it's a very, you know, I never understand how it happens. I think you just have to audition and regard that as the job. 
a lot of people say that. And I think that's the well, way one of the things in the UK, I don't know if you experience in the States, um, yeah. having I actually worked for my agent for a period, yes. and it would surprise you the number of actors who moan about not getting a casting, then don't bother to turn up. Don't bother so, to turn up where? To auditions? Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, good and right. and, uh, and mm. I often, when I'm talking to students, they ask me, you know, what's the tip? you know, of getting regular work. I, and I say, well, just turn up at the audition. <laughs> Sometimes you might just get the job by default because you're only one who turned up. Yeah, that but, can uh, happen. It, but it's, it's bizarre. Uh, I find that very bizarre indeed. But, yeah. uh, Speaking of bizarre, yeah. we're going to go to a commercial break. When we return, we're going to continue our discussion with Vanessa, Vanessa mm. and Matthew. When we return, please continue to stay logged on, tuned in, and become part of the legend. Stand by, folks. Here we go. Hi, my name is Jamie Engel, critically acclaimed author of The Toilet Papers, Places to Go While You Go, a short story collection suited to match your bathroom needs. Only have to go a little? No problem. I've got stories under a thousand words for you. Far from pooping? I've got you covered. With stories over 5,000 words to keep you occupied while your latrine stays occupied. And that's not all. The Toilet Papers is endorsed by the fine folks from Squatty Potty, the stool for better stools. But don't take my word for it. See what Dookie the Squatty Potty Unicorn has to say on YouTube. You won't be disappointed. Well, I've got to go, but you can grab your copy of The Toilet Papers on Amazon in ebook or print, or get an autographed copy from me at therightangle.com. And don't worry. I promise I'll wash my hands first. The toilet papers. You might just stay in the bathroom longer than you need to. We are, we are a touring acoustic duo crashing kitchens around the country. We go from house to house every Friday night and we create music, we create food, a good time, we stream it live and we do it for free. So now we're just really kind of like trying to develop it and build a community group that people believe in, then they'll help us. So we played from our rehearsal room. We played from the bathroom. Thankfully, that didn't catch on. I probably played guitar in my room, not for anyone, in front of anyone. Nobody heard for probably about 10 years. And then one Friday night, we played from the kitchen. It's the main place people want to be. It's where the food is. It's where the drink is. It's where the best lighting is. You can go to any party, and I guarantee you, the kitchen is going to be popping. Our ultimate goal I think would be to crash kitchens every Friday all around the world. Back, ladies and gentlemen, to the legend of the traveling TARDIS. My name is Christian Basil. We have our special guests, Matthew Jacobs and Vanessa Yule, who made this documentary called Doctor Who Am I? We're going to make discussions. Don't forget your chats. Melanie's actually in the producer's chair, so she's hitting up your chats. So if you have questions for Matthew, Vanessa, or anybody on our team, please, by all means, shout it out out there. Vanessa, your question How'd you meet this guy? <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. So when we first met, actually, it was when I was in um, grad school, and he was my uh, screenwriting and uh, directing instructor. Uh, but I was also working on my thesis film, which was a documentary at the time. And um, it just coincided. It was synergy that Matthew was working, um, was inspired to do a micro-budget film. And so I worked, uh, I was like a crew member, on it as well, the assistant director, as well as an actor in the film. And then Dylan Glockler, who is the cinematographer of Doctor Who Am I, um, we both worked with him many times, he's wonderful. And Dylan was also the cinematographer of Your Good Friend um, that Matthew mentioned before. So he um, was actually in film school, that's how I met him. And then it just developed into a friendship and a collaboration. Um, I mean, Matt, how, what would you say? That's that's pretty much accurate. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So you, and I mean, you the thing about, sorry, oh, the thing about Vanessa was, was we found we got on really well, and Vanessa was kind of slightly more than the assistant director on Your Good Friend and on Bar America. Both those films, I play 
uh, you play leading roles in. And the thing that Vanessa has that it, she has a real talent as a director, and she also has a tremendous talent uh, for no bullshit, I think. Um, which means that at the end of a take, I could turn to... Um, I'm sorry, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Give could, me YouTube, God. Don't could, do it. Don't do it. It wasn't I, in the first 30 seconds. We're okay. Yeah, that's right. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> Go ahead, yes. Man. Is there something wrong with you? Anyway, I could turn to Vanessa at the end of a take and basically say, did you believe that? Mm. Um, and she would give me a very honest answer, um, and which is really what you want to know when you're, if you're acting and directing at the same time, what you really want to know is, is what you're doing credible. Um, so we, but we became very much duo. So it was very much a natural thing for us to co-direct Dr. Who am I? We've got a question from the hashtag guru. Were there any plans to explore Gordon tipples master? Before you being captured by the Daleks, and what incarnation was he? Well, we never know about what the master. <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> sorry, what, sorry. What was the question? Uh, the question was: Were there any plans to explain Gordon Tibble, who is the master, for roughly about ten and a half seconds before he's executed and blown up in that little device thing? Uh, I guess he's wondering if there was going to be any backstory. I, I'm assuming yeah. if the series continued, would there be any Gordon Tibble master? Or there might have been. been. I mean, I have really no idea. I didn't. Um, it's. It's. Um, I'm really. My my knowledge of my back knowledge of the show is 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 pretty lacking. Obviously, my father was involved, and I remember it as a child. But I I de certainly couldn't go through all the pe all the different details. So I, no, there wasn't a specific plan on my part to bring was it Gordon Tibble back. Uh, Melanie, who's producing today, thank you so much, Melanie. When filming the documentary, was there ever a place where you couldn't bring the camera in and film? How did you work around that? It's a good question for Vanessa. Oh, how's my volume now? Is that better? Oh, it's perfect. Yes, okay. it's much better. Thank you. I just cranked it all the way up. Um, yes. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, I guess in the... Um, in the in Gallifrey, I guess there were some places that you, we couldn't film, like around the Starbucks area. So we had to make sure we didn't have any logos in. Um, but other than that, everyone, we had them sign kind of personal releases and location releases. So we didn't come across any issues unless I'm missing something, Matthew. Mm -hmm. I think there was... Um... Obviously, there are things that go on at conventions that we 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 didn't capture because conventions are wild, and in the evening people get together and they party and they get drunk and they do do things that we didn't really show that side of it. Um, and uh, so I suppose we didn't. Why show not? Sort of, well, <laughs> I, you know, I'm That's the Nessa, extended cut. I remember on the last day um, we went to a fantastic party. Um, and I remember walking around that going, why didn't we film any of this? You know, why, why didn't we, why didn't we film? I, do you remember that, Vanessa? It was that strange party at the end. Because oh. we didn't really cover, there were aspects of fandom that I think, you know, if we were to do it again or something like that, I think we might go into the sort of more, into those areas a little bit more. You know. The party, at, well, I mean, at some point we just wanted to stop filming and and have a night off. <laughs> I think that was it. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was it. But um, but so so I think the, the the aspects of of that. But we were never really shut out. Um, if people w wanted to be in it, they said yes, we want to do it, and and they would come, and they would, you know, a lot. We interviewed a lot of people, and there are a lot of people who we interviewed who are not in the not in the finished film. Um, nice, and, um, but it was it was definitely a it was definitely um, a very sort of inclusive thing, you know. And we ended up with a tremendous amount of material. And I mean, Vanessa was the editor of the film. I mean, she's she brought together like sort of however many hours, eighty odd hours of of material where we were exploring all these different people's things. And it's amazing that it's come down to eighty minutes. Um, so, so it's a really sixty to one ratio, you know. and it's a good, good eighty minutes. It's 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 like good the whole time. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's yeah. Good. yeah. excellent editing. Very well done. 
<laughs> we had, we, we um, had a lot of test screenings, which was very useful and just constant feedback. So it's always like, all right, got to go back to the footage. All right. Just got to go back to the footage. But, you know, since it did take us a long time to make, we were able to certainly refine it. So it flies at a pretty quick pace. And wherever there was a lull, it was like, all right, something's not working, whatever we can do to just keep the story moving. And so, so yeah. So if it, it now you say it take, took a long time and you started to what, 2015, I think you said. So here's, there's a quote near the end that may well have been at the very beginning of the filming asking how this, you thought this was going to change you, Matthew. And you said you didn't think it was going to. Yeah, and one point I did, after yeah. the fact, if that if that's still what you think now. Well, I think it has changed me. I mean, I mean, there was a point that that particular interview was during the um, uh, uh, well, while we were filming for the first time in Gallifrey, and and uh, by the time you get to the end of the documentary, which is in Long Island, um, and and then much later. Um, I, I, I felt as though it, it really, I, I found that I'd become a fan, basically. Um, uh, whereas at the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit um, supercilious or, or, you know, I'm a bit of an idiot, really. Um, not really um, opening, not really understanding this. So this, the process of understanding um, how fandom works has changed me slightly, given me much more of an appreciation that it's not so much about the show, really. It's about the community that, mm -hmm. and I know that's a easy thing to say, but to truly realize the communal nature um, of fandom, um, whatever it's for, be it for um, uh, Star Trek or Star Wars or any, or, or Doctor Who or anything, you know, the, com the, the way in which we come together as fans, to realize that was incredibly, invigorating and and in a way um brought about a, my own little um my own little regeneration if you like which you see in the film when you first went to your first convention and how did you feel and how did the hoovians ultimately treat you when you first walked in there and set up everything how did they make you feel well there were some some who were, were, were very honest and, and we show that in the film um, and then, um, but for the most part, um, the fans treat you with a tremendous amount of respect if you if you've been involved in making the show, um, and uh, and you you just get this kind of joy, this feeling of pleasure. Um, they should, which which fans share with with um, the 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 show makers and the actors, and it it's very it's it's very rewarding. Um, Paul talks about it. Paul wasn't massively keen to go on go on around conventions, and then as he did it, he became he he, he became he becomes like the Yoda in our story, doesn't he, Vanessa? He sort of tells tells the tells the truth. Um, uh, well, I do like the advice he gave you um, when you were first going on panels. You didn't know what to do. He goes, "Just start talking and uh, just be yourself, and you'll be surprised yep. what comes out of your mouth." And eventually, yes. they ask very loaded and complicated questions. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. be careful. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, um, my my question. Uh, I have another question. Uh, you know, since you you are a you know, a writer and all this, and you've done this in the past and you're still continuing to work, and the, there is now more opportunities to write for Doctor Who, uh, including like Big Finish and things like that. Have you thought mm -hmm. about revisiting the 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 old, uh, going back to the well, as it were? <laughs> well, I, I think I'd have to, I think, I don't think they'd invite me. I, I don't know. We, we are actually, um, we're gonna come to Gallifrey, aren't we, next, next month, in the middle of next month, and we're doing a panel with Chris Chibnall and that's going to oh. be that's going to be fascinating. Um, Vanessa, myself, um, a director from from Paul the Salamoff. Show, and Paul Salamoff is is a, is um, is is a, you know running the panel. Um, Please and don't be filming that. <laughs> yeah. So so bit by bit, I'm getting that's to meet people who are more currently involved with the show, um, and it's the balls in their court if they wanted me to write. They could they could easily ask me to do that, but but I I like making 
I, I like making the films I'm making at the moment, to be honest, and and uh, and I'm sure there are better writers out there for Doctor Who. Um, so I'm not talking myself out of a job, but kind of. Um, I think no, no, that, no. If if you if you write, I, I won't tell people too much, but I will be the first person by half human. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be in line. So this is no. This is number two, number three, number four. I know everybody. Well, I'll you be number one that. when it comes to the Broadway musical. I think there we go. Human. Yeah, Doctor Who the musical. There we That's go. That's right. We talk about it in the Put documentary. This man on the musical. We talk about. We talk about <laughs> doing a show oh, called no. Half Human. That's that would be fun. Yeah. Gotcha there. Another question. I have uh, Mark Robinson. I have questions for Matthew. Did you write Doctor Who the movie? And Star Wars Starfighter at the same time, and how did you find writing for the two different media?s Well, Star Wars Starfighter was one of the first PlayStation Two games, um, and what had been going on was um, Lucas. I was living in Marin, and uh, um, George Lucas wasn't very happy with the dialogue in in the, in the games. So initially, I got put onto a game called Outlaws, um, and uh, which was a fun first-person shooter game. And then Breaking. when, when and uh, yeah, uh, and we won lots of awards with that. So I was writing these scenes, basically, um, that you were, when you got to a certain level, you would, these scenes would play out and all the dialogue that went on during the game. <laughs> and when they came to do PlayStation, the PlayStation 2 version of, of mm -hmm. Star Wars Starfighter, um, George was happy to let me create work with them to create new characters because LucasArts didn't really want to just do the Phantom Menace. They wanted to create these other characters. So it was very exciting. But in comparison between the two, Doctor Who and, and Star Wars, um, they, uh, they're just these massive franchises um, and if somebody offers for you to come on board these things, it's a, it's an enormous honor. It's the sort of thing you dream about as a child, that one day somebody would let me write or be involved in these things. And so you really just have to bring yourself to the table and enjoy it. And I think that's what I really did with both of them. Um, and, and I do whenever I'm brought onto anything. Um, I know that, See, this is where I'm I'm loving things right there. Oh, go, go ahead and bring up that comment out there. I'll read it. Who was the genius or the genius team who designed the TARDIS interior for the movie? To clarify, well, the interior seems to have been an influence on the 2005 revival of the series, and we can safely say bigger on the inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love but, that interior. That, I it, want that isn't it wonderful? Who, I, I think it's, his name was Hulan. I mean, his name, I didn't get to know him that well. Everything was happening up in Vancouver. I was locked away in a hotel room for the most part, rewriting stuff. Didn't spend much time with him. But as soon as, as, soon as I saw the, the, um, the set he, they built, I, I, I was in love with it too. They, they'd gone for it. it. The only thing that was in the script um, was, was I talked about how... Um, yeah, how when you look at sort of the Russian um, site, R Russian space program, or you look at the sort of tremendously ornate way in which things were built at the bit in the First World War, the way dreadnoughts were built, all of those things, there was there was a there was a sense of design, and I think that was something that Philip really wanted. Philip was the sort of true guide for the look of the interior of the TARDIS. And uh, and and they had a they spent most of the budget on it. We had like five million dollar budget. Two million was spent on building those sets. Only two. <laughs> yes, but well, we're talking about ninety six. Two million was a, yeah. it was it was a big build, and um, and it was a tremendous amount of tremendous amount of work. They were building it for a series, and the aim was to have more adventures inside the TARDIS. So from you could go from inside the TARDIS into different dimensions. You didn't necessarily have to go out the front door always. So Vanessa, in editing and compiling the documentary, I do a lot of, I'm big with the tinfoil hat crowd. I do a lot of werewolf and UFO documentaries and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, but um, that's why you guys don't know me, but I, 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 I'm big in a niche. I field. love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, you know, you know, 
I'm, I'm on like a minute and a half of ancient alien. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, my, my question for you is when you're editing, you know, I, I did, I do a lot of documentaries too. And, uh, you know, they, they interview me for three or four hours and then cut it into like a minute and a half. So, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Nice, Brian. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, what's, what for you in this, what was the biggest challenge? Cause you were, it was a lot of on the run. I could see people, you know, your, your people are walking and talking and doing all that. That's complete. I'm usually the sit down talking head type. So what is, you know, your big, what was your biggest challenge editing that sort of things together to, to give it the flow that you gave it? Well, the biggest challenge was that I'd never edited a feature before. Neither of us had done a documentary, um, filmed one. I mean, I did, you know, I've done short, shorter form, and I've edited, work in commercials and stuff. But, you know, editing a documentary is was a challenge and it was daunting. Um, so the first thing was really um, I had to transcribe all of the interviews. I was like, I'd heard like, oh, okay, you should transcribe and whatever. I was like, all right. So I kind of did that all myself because we had no money. Um, and then it was just, okay, I'm making selects of what I, we think is important or what we think is interesting. And then in the beginning, and Matthew was a part of this too, we started just breaking the footage down by making vignettes of people. So people that we met along the way, we then just sort of broke it down into their own little stories. Um, and then, you know, Matthew was very, he didn't want to go to back to the, into the Doctor Who convention or into the Whovian world again, because he did have strong feelings about not wanting to go back. But um, I knew I wanted the story to really focus on Matthew. So um, then it was just slowly really just throwing pieces in the timeline is which where you just have to start. And then it's just crafting the story from there. And thankfully, Matthew, you know, he's a screenwriter. And I learned so much about just the three act or, you know, the three act structure and story. So a lot of it was then I just literally I would go to Matthew's place and sit on the kitchen counter kitchen table and then he's over off in his desk, you know, writing and doing other stuff. And so then I'd just be sitting there editing things together be like, Hey, check this out. What do you think? And then, you know, we'd sort of talk things through and it eventually just got to a point where I just follow my instincts and I was like, okay, I think this, something like this has to happen. And it's just constantly going back to the footage. It's just like, you think you make your select string. No, you just always have to go back to the interview and find that sound bite that actually carries you into the next thought. And um, so, I mean, at first it was, yes, extremely overwhelming and just all these bits of paper or like I saw it as these, all these little color pieces of construction paper. And it's like, how am I supposed to make an image out of this? But then eventually after you get through all of the horrible first cuts, you're like, there's never going to be a story here, <laughs> but just prevailing. <laughs> and then slowly, like it comes together. And then you're like, oh, wow, it actually, it's actually a beautiful dress now. And it was just bits of paper before, but um, it was perseverance. And I think having the two of us, I mean, it's just the two of us, um, mm. you know, having another, uh, a hand to hold on to or a shoulder or something yeah. to just get yeah. through it um, was kind of really key. Because if I was just sitting there editing it by myself, it's just like you can just, for me, just stop yourself short and be like, oh, this is shit. I can't do this. Sorry. This is so <laughs> terrible. This is so terrible. I can't, I can't go any further with this. But, you know, yeah. just keep going. Excellent. Nice Thank story. you. Speaking of keep going, we are going into our after party. Vanessa, Matthew, you are more than welcome to stay for the yeah. after party. Uh, we're going to keep talking, but our folks who are listening on the audio or on sci-fi.radio, unfortunately, we have to say goodbye, but thank you for joining us. Uh, again, uh, don't forget uh, to sign up. Uh, YouTube.com, like, share, subscribe, because that's how we get the algorithms. We're closing in on 3,000 Facebook uh, YouTube subscribers. So right now, if you get a chance, please, YouTube.com, The Legend of the Traveling Tardis. Uh, also, don't forget, we're on TikTok. <laughs> and also, um, on our Facebook page, uh, we have over 65. I did it again, didn't I? Yes. Hold on. I did it again. Hold on. <sighs> Hold on. As it happened this morning. 
We now have 66,000 Whovians. Thanks <laughs> to January, we have accumulated 1,000 more Whovians into our entourage. So, everybody, thank you for joining us on the Facebook.com slash The Legend of the Traveling Tardis and quickly growing. 66,000. You guys are crazy. I guess you really like that tiny little TARDIS, but yeah, there, yeah, that's a number. And also for those of you listening on our uh, on the audio, iHeartRadio, Sci-Fi Radio, Odyssey, Spotify, Speaker, Podbean, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast, you can download for free and listen to our audio. So for those of you who are sticking around, uh, again, Vanessa and Matthew, you stay as long as you want to, but we are just going to go ahead and end the audio portion and give us one second. We'll be right back. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around with us and always become part of the legend. Oh, Vanessa can stay. Wait a minute. Who do we lose? Hey. <laughs> we, lost, we lost Simon. We lost Simon. Okay. Yeah, because I think Simon. Hey, it's 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 late for him. So I know. Late. I know. And I know he was having some technical issues. But thank you. Uh, thanks, Simon, for joining us. Melanie, you want to get in here? Go for it. Uh, Mark Robinson, not sure if it has been said to Matthew, but as a Whovian from the UK, I would like to say big thank you for creating the Eighth Doctor character without matter. We may never palm again as the Eighth Doctor, so thank you so much out there. Well, so, it's appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you and, for watching. And what for I think of to live through the great dark times when there was no Doctor <laughs> Who, we were thankful and we were very happy that it was as good as it was. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Thanks. I think this is just my assessment, and I, I tell me if I'm wrong, uh, Matthew. I just I think for us, because I was in the states when it when it appeared, I was in I was in college, and what believe it or not, it was part of the Fox Tuesday night movie. I saw the commercial when I was just staying up one night at 3 a.m. It was the first time I saw the commercial, and I saw that spinning TARDIS from the trial of the Time Lord, and then Paul McGann putting his hand through the window. And right. it was just a few moments, and it says, yes, we're having a Doctor Who movie. I'm like, how? <laughs> how does Fox have a Doctor Who movie? I was just like, okay. But I would thought nothing of it, and I just left the recorder on one night to see if I would catch the commercial, and surely enough, it did. And wow. I was excited, and that's how that's I amazing. knew. Yeah, and I was, I recorded it. Um, there's an off-campus lounge, and every time I went to the lounge in between classes, I would play the movie over and over and over again until I was oh, in space. Was this that's the a, time of VHS recording when you had to put the tape in, hit record, yes. and hope yes. that no. it had enough to yes. cover the movie? Okay. Yes. And if you're using the cable Sorry. box, you couldn't record one channel and watch another. You just had to leave it on no. the one channel. You're stuck Yep. So okay. welcome Melanie to the to the show. <laughs> this is the lovely Melanie. I've been here. Yeah. It's in the background. Like, ah! the magic in the background. It's a little tight in here, but I wanted to uh show you something, Matthew. Um I think this actually took place after Gally Wim, because I know he was at a convention, it was around his birthday. Uh, but Megacon down here gave me the privilege of hosting Paul McGann. And we uh, did something. This was, I think, it was like five years ago. Melanie, is that? Oh, it's got to be more than that. Be more than that. Yeah, it's, it's more than that. Because I was, I, we it's did not me. know each other yet, and I was in that. Oh, panel that's party. right. So uh, I'll show you something that was happening since you kind of mentioned his birthday in um, in you your do. documentary. Uh, here's Paul, and we gave him the biggest treat, uh, Florida style. Of course, we had to give him mouse ears. <laughs> and I, I uh, mentioned that he had to do the entire show uh, with mouse ears on, or else I would not host the. I would not host it, and of course, in Paul McGann style, he wore the mouse ears. Uh, we got him a birthday cake, which he yeah. happily distributed to everybody out in the uh, in the audience. And Melanie mm -hmm. happened to be. I don't know if I have the picture with you. There, I'm right there. Oh, I'm there you are there. Yep. I'm in the background. Well, the, the, okay, on the very kind of behind seat. the guy grabbing the cake. Yes, that's yep. it. <laughs> yep, and, and yep, I'm back there. There and you the guy go. There you the, go. Got the picture now. The sad thing is, this? I didn't know you. Yeah. And the bottom right is Nisha Mulchin. Yeah, yeah. who so did Nisha's there. Didn't know her at the time. We we're all on the podcast, and yeah, my husband's in the photo too. So it's it's funny how we were all there, but we didn't know each other well, yet. And I had a panel opposite it, and I was so mad because. Oh. <laughs> I missed it. But I don't know if you, uh, Matthew, if you're familiar with the traveling TARDIS, I'll give you the rundown for you and Vanessa. Ten years ago, I bought a TARDIS 
uh, die cast art model. Unfortunately, he's asleep in the other room because uh, I haven't unpacked yet. <laughs> so, oh, wow. uh, yeah, so he has had, if you can see here in this picture, this is a funny one, too, because Paul is a big fan of that little blocks. He loves right. taking a picture with it. And uh, he just happened to be with um, uh, right. Eric Roberts at Florida Supercon. And I he won the picture. And I said, could you and Eric put a picture together fighting over the box, uh, over the TARDIS? <laughs> And yeah, and it was uh, Paul was going, come on, come on, Eric, let's do this, do this. And Eric's like, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> so eventually he got his own picture with the TARDIS. Yiji got his own picture with the TARDIS. Daphne well, that's good. owned the picture with the TARDIS. So they all have a unity. And plus, a good friend of mine wanted me to make sure you saw this picture. Well, um, thank you. This one particular picture because of Eric Roberts. He was some people weren't happy that Eric was part of the master, but he took this picture of him. I'm canonical and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> what, does, what does it say there? I'm canonical and there's nothing you can do about it. Meaning well, that exactly. there's nobody can get rid of it. Eric Roberts' master. So Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, those are great. Right. No. I mean, so when was when was Paul with you? Was that was that in 2016, 17? I... It had to be like five years ago or something like that. Yeah. It was more than five years ago. Yeah. More than I think five it was years. Fourteen ago. or fifteen, because that was my yeah. first year doing Erie, Florida panels. Yeah. Wow. I'm I'm sure I'm Melanie's on it. Yeah. Look up. Uh, it was called Megacon Fan Days. After yeah. having watched Doctor Who, this is Dan Holyfield. Uh, check him out on his podcast, The Last Man Standing, up on YouTube. After having watching Doctor Who and PBS and made video vhs tapes having the doctor come back during the great hiatus was an awesome treat i was sad it didn't go this Agreed. go to the series but it was what it was um it was november 22nd 2015 oh geez a lot okay. more than five years yeah wow 2015 yeah it was it was 2015 so that was yes that was um before we saw him because we mm -hmm. saw well, it was around this. It was around that time, wasn't it? Vanessa? I think it was his first U.S. tour, yes, so I yes. think it would have been around then. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. So I think we had a question in the chat, right? There was one. Leaving. Somebody was asking was if anything ended up on the cutting room floor. Yeah. yeah. There. there we go. And, and I'm like, well, stuff. tons of stuff ended up <laughs> on the cutting room floor. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we? You know, what do we? I mean, there, there, there was um, definitely more. Um, everybody we interviewed, um, we asked them, um, you know, who is what would who would you say is the Doctor in you? Um, and this was something that um, that would take a lot of the a lot of the time. People would be talking about uh, the Doctor in inside of them. And those, those, there was some very interesting stuff that came out of that, but we did have to leave on the cutting cutting room floor. But, um, but a lot more but, of Daphne. I miss, yes, you know, there's a lot, a lot of Daphne. Daphne. Yes. She's in it. She has a great sort of, I mean, she's so wonderful in it, but there was just more with her. She's such a, a wonderful, I don't know, just, just this energy. Like whoever, whoever has met her knows but it's just like she is that just wonderful and warm in person and so we had a lot more behind the scenes with her and even paul um and a lot of yeah some of the people that we interviewed just more of their their lives and their just interesting stories of how they got in into doctor who like there was um we interviewed a fireman who was uh you know at 9-11 and was um, kind of, he has a really kind of intense story telling us his experience. He's already had, you know, having health problems and everything, but he actually used Doctor Who as sort of, um, you know, as a way for people to, to connect and sort of um, take away s some of the horrors of what they'd been seeing. So he was playing it like in, in the break room and stuff like that um, for the firemen and stuff. Oh, and wow. that didn't. But they were clearing him. up. Yeah, Ground Zero. They were clearing up, and and he, he's it's it's very haunting because he's describing this horrific, and and the, and there was another person we interviewed as well, an electrician who who who, who sadly has passed since, who also had a wonderful stories, a wonderful story about nine eleven, and um, and so that element of how 
um, everybody brought something to the table of how the of how Doctor Who provided a, sort of a balance to what was going on in their life because we all go through trauma of, of one kind of or another. It's just a human thing. It's how you learn, mm -hmm. and it's how how those those things. But for some reason, Doctor Who um, has become this tremendous touchstone um, for people because there's an optimism, I think, behind the idea of Doctor Who um, that is very attractive. Um, certainly was attractive to me as a child, and I think it's been attractive to other people. But that guy who worked for the New York Fire Department um, was was would, that was a marvelous story that we couldn't include. You're right. Yeah, it was how just, are we supposed just, to follow up on that? Yeah, how are we supposed just, to follow that story? <laughs> well, I mean, it just sounds like a very, it, right, it, everybody. It a yeah. very therapeutic form of escapism. <laughs> so yeah. that you could just compartmentalize everything away and just, you know, be able to to be happy, be in a better sphere mentally than having to, you know, have to deal with all those those constant emotions that he had that were just probably very very arresting to him. Yeah, yeah. he's wonderful. out there. And, and it'd be uh, lovely to see him. I mean, it was just interesting how everybody had their own very personal story of what brought them to the doctor. Some of it was just like childhood, but others it was just definitely this identifying with this person, whereas all the individual can change the world. And so yes. everyone had such a wonderful responses. We couldn't fit them all in. And so, yes, a ton ended on the cutting room floor, and maybe there will be extras one day. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you find the time to edit some more. Right. <laughs> you're like, oh, uh, I'll get right on that. Um, was it Bruce yeah, Campbell so did Fanalysis, where he was interviewing all the Evil Dead fans, and he did that, and he was talking about he was just going to do a, a one just super cut with everything, and it was going to mm -hmm. be 12 hours long and 20 discs, and he was going to sell it for $20 a disc so he could make more money. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Really? <laughs> well, well, this, the thing is the amount of time it takes to pull these things together. Um, and, There's a budget. Uh, yeah. We do it. But we started yeah. this budget. with just the spirit of, oh, let's make a movie. Yeah. Right. Let's go <laughs> shoot. And so within two months, we were filming. And then we're like using our own money. And we did do a little like yeah. Kickstarter. We did find some other money. But yeah. it's been like, you know, kind of our money. And it's just like, oh, the joys of independent filmmaking. Um, How many hours of raw, raw footage do you have? Well, I think it's like about, I have to add it up again. It's at least 80, yeah, at least 80, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Well, you we, see, sometimes it would be two cameras as well. Um, <laughs> so, so. Oh, counting two cameras, it'd be more. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean. It's equal. Yeah. It's it's equal. Equal. Yeah, Doctor Who am I again? Doctor Who am I forever? <laughs> no, somebody no, said, somebody the said they what somebody said they wanted um Chris Chibnall to do uh, a Doctor Who am I um which I think would be interesting because more time I think, needs to pass. Yeah, yeah more time needs time to pass to before he does it. But I'm I'm fascinated. Um I think I think he you know, he's done a fantastic job. I mean it's not easy running that show and he was a showrunner. I just did one thing. Um uh, and he so he's had this He's done this marvelous, there's a tremendous amount of work there. And I admire the fact that he's still, he's always been a fan and a follower of Gallifrey. And I admire the fact that he's going back there. And I'm excited. I'm really excited to meet him. Um, Start planning now. Yeah. We have for years, Dr. Who has, uh, fans have begged a Paul McGann series. Now with RTD back, if an opportunity came about, would you want to be involved? Of course. Absolutely, I would, I would, I would leap at the opportunity. Work. <laughs> I need the work, the same because yeah. I mean, I very much took it's talk. We talk about this, don't we, Vanessa, in the in the documentary that I've stopped waiting for permission to make films, and that's kind of where Doctor Who Am I comes from. That attitude um, uh, after two thousand and seven, the sort of economic collapse, that the TV movie kind of disappeared, which was my bread and butter. And, and uh, that when that went away, I decided, well, I'm going to do some teaching. And I did teach because there was, right. was a writer's strike. And then from that, I started doing some acting. And then from that, I take, took this new attitude, which is, 
we're just going to make our films. As soon as we come up with an idea for a film, it, they're, it's going to be greenlit and we're going to make it. Uh, and the money will come. Well, that way lies poverty. But basically, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Which is true. True. <laughs> so I would writer, definitely yeah. take a job if it was offered to me. Yes. Matthew, well, I let me ask your question. You've been dying since you weren't allowed on the panel. Come on, ask your question, Melanie. Oh, I I can't. My cat just knocked everything down. I was on mute, so I'm just trying to make sure everyone's. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, oh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh, Catalet. Catalet. Yeah, we have a, a yes. Uh, we have team team members who have cats just roaming about. So anytime that we have a cat alert, anytime I have a, a giant cat lizard, alert, we, we don't have a alert. lizard alert yet, but we're gonna get there. Can I? Can actually? I think I know what Melanie's going with this. Can I introduce? Yep. Or you, if you want to ask a question, go for it, Melanie. I'll are talk to what you have you been wanting to talk I, about I, with Matthew since we announced we were getting him? Oh, I wanted to talk Emperor's New Groove and there how there go. was a script, Thank but you. wasn't a script, but there yet was there was kind of a script and was like, eh, just write this. I just so Emperor's my New question Groove. was yes, but... at what point were you in Emperor's New Groove? And just a little bit of, of that kind of fun. Why do we even have that level? Um, <laughs> yes. um I I was a, it was really, really early days. I I'd, okay. I'd done a um uh um a lassie for um, in '94, which was when um, uh, was when The Lion King came out. Um, uh, we also I'd I'd written for Paramount Pictures and uh, a new lassie movie, which was was my first real Hollywood movie, and and obviously we got totally crushed by by The Lion King and Lassie made was luckily made thirteen million. 15 million, you know, and Lion King was making a billion um, mm -hmm. and breaking all records and things like that. So I had innocently told, and then I went for various jobs and didn't get them, um, uh, whereas Linda Wolverton did. Um, and, uh, and so I innocently told my agent, you know, um, you've got to get me one of these um, animated features. You know, I, they, they make money. <laughs> and, uh, it would be good for me. And so she teamed me up with Roger Alice, who who had seen my young indies and seen Lassie and really liked them. And Roger wanted to do a... Roger had directed The Lion King, um, and Roger wanted to do a piece that was around about Machu Picchu. And he basically showed me a picture of Machu Picchu and said, this is what I want to do next. Let's come up with a story for this. And very quickly, actually, we came up with the story that is the finished version of Emperor's New Group of, a, of an arrogant emperor that gets turned into a llama and has to hack his way back to being a, a human uh, by learning the mean of, meaning of friendship. And that was, that was the original idea, which stayed right, right, okay. right the way. And then I basically did six drafts of a script. We, it went into development very quickly. It was called Kingdom of the Sun. Um, I refer to it a little bit at the beginning of the documentary. Um, and, uh, and Kingdom of the Sun was going to be a musical. We had Sting. We had, mm -hmm. That's why we had Earth Kit. We, we, there were songs. There were love songs. There was a romance, which later came into Emperor's New School. It was a hot, it was a it was a kind of a different animal. I called mm -hmm. it the Lama King because it was very much in the vein of 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 of, of you know the Lion King, um, but but about about um, the Incan world. And then it changed. I went off to do another another movie for the BBC, I think, called Mother Time. Um, and when I got back from doing Mother Time, I was invited to the screening. Um, and uh, of what they'd done, how far they'd got, and it just wasn't working. You know, you start on Disney films, one or two writers start, and then they bring in a lot of other writers. So sometimes there are 12, 15 writers, and there are story artists. It's a, it's a you know, for want of a better word, a cluster, F-U-C-K. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's intense. Um, and so I was glad to, a bit to be out of it, but when I came back, they, it really wasn't working, um, and so that at that point it went through a crisis, and luckily 
Um, David Reynolds, who, who ends up with the main screenwriting credit, had a tremendous ear for um, David Spade's character. Um, and uh, David Reynolds turned it into the script that it is. So I hope that answers your question. Basically, I was in at the beginning, did the first six drafts, and then stayed friends with them. And I still meet up with all those guys. And, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but it, it, it's a long process. So that started in 94, didn't reach the screen until 2000. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was going to say, it's, I, I absolutely love that movie. I, lo I always remember watching it, the DVDs of it, and I know it didn't really do well at box office, but it kind of part of that cult kind of thing. Is, oh, no, you got to watch this. You got to watch this. And then slowly, it's done okay. because of YouTube, finding out, oh, no, this yeah. was supposed to be Empire of the Sun and that it was supposed to be like a brother story. And then you just start hearing how it just moved and everything. And at that point, I was... Uh, Earlier, like with my first like college kind of careers, I wanted to go into I wanted to go into filmmaking, and I've since right. like, changed somewhere else. So I was just so intrigued. Going, wait, what was this process? Wait, how it is that fascinating? Happen? There's dig out, dig there out really a documentary. Script? There's a documentary called In the Sweat Box that was made by Sting's wife Trudy, mm -hmm. right. um, um, and it's deaf, and you can find it in, in its cut and copy form, you know, with, with the numbers, you know, your time code at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, Disney tried to suppress it, um, it but it was oh. it, it goes in detail into the what, into that transition it made from being a musical to to being uh, what it is. I think um, I got a confession to make. Um, I've told very few people about this. Oh. I never really had a Disney favorite Disney film. I told people for the longest time Aladdin because I was a big Robin Williams fan, but I never yeah. really had a connection to a Disney film. And I consider The Emperor's New Groove, and I've considered this when I've talked to people, it's the Caddyshack of Disney movies. It was <laughs> the movie that wasn't supposed <laughs> to work, but somehow it worked. Yeah, it and what I loved about this is, I, I, I hadn't talked to you about this, but it basically for me, when I tell people, it's like, oh, what works as a Disney film? Okay, let's crap it and let's do this. Because we didn't have the beautiful princess heroine. We didn't have the prince. We had a lead character, which was kind of, you know, at first we hated him. You know, yeah. he, was this, he was this idiot and it became a buddy-buddy movie. We The only music out of this movie is that beautiful song, uh, mm. My two funny friends uh, from Stan. Funny friend of mine. Funny my friend, funny of, friend me. of me. And then you had mm. Yzma and Kronk and all these characters. And what looks like, it, you know, it just looked like what I loved about it is it took the Disney playbook and threw it out and said, let's try this. Something that yeah. should not work at Disney. And that became, for the longest time, my favorite Disney movie oh. of all time. That's and I was I was kind of ashamed of it because transition. we do it in Doctor Who Am I, don't we, Vanessa? Basically, the transition from somebody being a dickhead um, <laughs> to being to being um, to becoming a man. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so, so it's, it's he's what, actually you... a llama in most of the documentaries. So <laughs> That's right. Know. That's right. He's, so <laughs> well, it was it, it was just something that I could have fun with and relate and makes... to because it was fun. I think it was also because uh, the uh, trailers had Earth, Wind, and Fire as their music. So I was yeah. like, okay, you got it. Oh, go, find, yes. go find Eartha Kitt's song "Snuff Out the Light." That's when I first, when I heard, yeah. saw that on now, YouTube. That was going, in the original music. And going, wait, this, what is this? Yeah. And then that's when I, I ran down the, went down the rabbit hole of the original. Yeah. So that makes it's because obviously McGann, that's why you cast out the kit because it's a musical. That makes Paul McGann the, the, uh, the John Goodman. <laughs> yeah. For, for the yes. documentary. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Paul's like the John Goodman of the documentary. Yeah. That's now, right. Um, now, this is one oh, of actually, my favorite. Actually, I think Vanessa is. Well, there you go. There you go. Vanessa's, Vanessa's with the funny friends. So yeah. Paul McGann is Kronk then. He's the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, I'm sure he loves uh, that. Next time, we have him, next time we have him on, Christian, remind me to tell him that. So. No, I'm going to get That's Patrick true. Warburton in a, in a Wild Bill outfit. <laughs> there we go. But, um, He's coming so, out of the TARDIS. Uh, one of my favorite books is uh, The Nth Doctor, which talks about all the movies that didn't make oh it. Oh, my God. Yes. Yes, I still got it. And I love you know how all, all the trials and tribulations to get it back on the air and all that 
Uh, but this, the, 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 the fact reading all this and then you guys made it happen just, you know, fills this old Whovian's heart with joy. Cause I was the, again in the long dark, we remember those days. So that was the uh, love fist. Yes. They, they, the fan world in 1996 was very different. Wasn't it Vanessa? Um, the, uh, it was great when Philip described how that worked, that the, that the fans then who wrote that book, um, the end doctor jammed universe, the universal switchboard when oh, there was a question right. yep. of I, yeah, for the longest time, Matthew said that happened, but then we didn't have any, you know, we weren't sure if it was truth, but then we saw Philip in August and he's like, oh yeah, that totally happened. And they got in a lot of trouble for it or <laughs> like American fans swarmed the, the switchboard to like, make sure that the, the TV movie happened. Um, they, I'm yeah, I guess the universal of, switchboard kind of like that, went I down. <laughs> Doctor Who would not exist today if it were not. For the American fandom, it's that simple. Yeah, I, I think I know, just, when, when it came back, it didn't come over here for a couple of years because they weren't sure if it would still, you know, even when it, even the 2005, it still took a year or so to come over here legally. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, there were other ways, uh, in the early days, uh, but um. And that, and it was um, so thrilling when it finally did, and and then we were able to go. Oh, and then there was this one that everybody kind of forgot about, and uh, you know you would find the bootlegs at the you know at the cons in the old days, and uh, and you know and I, I think only what it didn't come out on DVD till I want to say around 2010, 2011. I think it was a long time wow. yes. before it came out on DVD. So, Dave, you got some pictures? Are, are these? for the show then? Yep. Those yeah. last couple three. So I I yeah. I've loved the movie. I really do. I kind of fell into this show. One of my first episodes was what is the scary who's the scariest villain? And I said Yiji was. I said Jang Lee was. <laughs> because he just went with the master I'm like, yeah, okay, let's do this. <laughs> and, and I actually got a chance to go around to some of the filming locations with with him uh a few wow. years after we interviewed him because we've We've interviewed several people from the movie, including yeah. Paul Sylvester, but also yeah. Jeremy Raddick, E.G. Um, yeah, but I We're got trying to, go. to get Eric I, and I Daphne. We need Eric yep. and Daphne. Let them yeah. know. I'm like, so E.G.'s considered a bad guy? I guess I. Yeah, it depends on how you want to come out. <laughs> he, he was kind of the master's companion. Yeah, but he <laughs> just didn't get it. He, he heard what? Yeah, when changes. we interviewed E.G., E.G. actually People, smiled go. when we told him about that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's basically where Sylvester was shot. I'm standing yeah, almost under exactly where he got out. Yep. Yep. So, and, I, um, and I actually he, went and filmed a, uh, a review off at the park there. Oh, yeah. That's that's where they did the final goodbye. The it was the rainiest yeah. night ever. We were, we were oh, all really? soaking wet when we filmed that. Uh, Terrible. Oh, no. um, and uh, Paul's wig looked like <laughs> roadkill. <laughs> the wig. Landed on, landed I was on his head. Um, and uh, they were so professional. I mean, it was like they did that entire scene with, you know, the farewell, which is actually quite a touching farewell and quite revolutionary for Doctor Who because she's saying, stay with me. You stay with me. Yeah. Um, and um, and it's uh, that was stayed. That scene stayed exactly the same as it was right from the very first draft. It oh. was the sort of it was the sort of tent pole um, of the of the of the film of the film for me, it was really about my love of the Doctor. Um, and uh, and I think it's, um, uh, and, you know, so you put yourself into it and then you end up on a rainy night um, and it's freezing cold because it gets really cold up there. Um, and these, uh, these actors are doing this scene and they brought it to life. Um, I don't know how they did it. They were just wonderful. Um, they just did a marvelous job. And if you look on the film, you can actually see the rain. Yeah. Uh, you can see, no, thing you, I see, uh, you can see a little bit in Yiji's book because Yiji took a bunch of photos on the set. Oh, really? I've never seen that. You, you've never seen this book? Oh, oh yeah. He's, got, he's done it, a video never, version of it, actually. Yeah. Oh, I should get it. But he's got, it's really hard to find the physical one, but he's got the digital one. But he's got all these different locations and whatnot. Oh, fantastic. Um, and there's the, but yeah, it's all just um, photos that he took on the set. Yeah. It's so many. Back at the time. It's, yep. it's if, great. Oh. Philip with, uh, right. with Sylvester. Yes, there you go. 
That was, it was way a, back it, when, when the camera wasn't, you know, right here in the palm of your hand. Yeah. Oh no, they were big Panavision <laughs> they were cameras. Big and, they were, and they, were like, <laughs> they were like trucks. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I have this mentality now that the next time that Russell T. Davies brings on um, Paul McGann as the eighth doctor, I'm going to bring an actual roadkill. And I said, Matthew wants you to wear this while you're on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has was a little fan cartoon that really just wanted. is a picture of them of them holding the, the wig. And it's and McGann just looking at it going, burn it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. He turned up with his hair cut short. They, they, every, every, poor, poor Philip practically had a hernia um, because one of the big reasons he cast Paul was because Rule had, Paul had these Byron-esque sort of locks um, mm. when he did the audition. Of course, the audition had been done a few years before and he was doing a military role and he had this short hair. Um, and so they they dashed out and got that wig. It was a, but, but, you know, um, it's all okay at the end of the day. Um, it's 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 fine. I like his. I like the look that Paul put together. I don't, 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 didn't you, Vanessa? I like the look that Paul put together for Night Night of the Doctor. Yeah, more later mm -hmm. versions. He's like he's cool. He's like you know, mm -hmm. had as an yeah. edge. It's yeah, like dark colors and everything. The short hair is great. And he mm -hmm. he looks he looks like the Doctor now. So yes, I yes. can't I can't wait. I mean. I'll just say that yes, there is gonna. I mean, I just hope, but I'm you know, I will. I'll just be positive and think that yes, there will be a spinoff, and then we can just see like oh. cool, cool eighth doctor on his adventure. Yes, I. Yes, I mean, it was. It's almost a shame that he regenerated into John Hurt because I would have loved to have seen the regeneration into Eccleston because Eccleston with his leather jacket and with his with his personality seemed to be really speak a lot to where. Where Paul was going through his years um, on Big Finish, and and, and you know, and, you know I, I, I think I think I think it's a strange it's a strange thing and how 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 Doctor Who works is a mystery to me. I don't wear robes. Well. I don't wear robes. I don't yeah, wear that was funny. <laughs> that was great. Yes, that yeah. great line. So, in the so speaking of legally, when are we going to be able to legally see this documentary in the U.S. besides no. special screenings? Okay, well, so before we'll, 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 we should do a little more plug on the documentary for yes, people. Yes, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, well, let's bring them back so, up. So, yeah, so, so, uh, Doctor oh, so. Who Am I? Um, it's sort of an exploration of the American Doctor Who fandom, and it's following you know Matthew Jacobs and his journey, really from not being a fan to you know he's not being a fan to becoming a fan. And it's like, you know, Matthew's funny guy. You've been watching this show probably. And he's, uh, I, I always, I describe him like it's a Ricky Gervais, Larry David kind of character. Throw him into the, you know, this convention with Doctor Who fans. We're expecting him to be, you know, you know these fans to be angry with him, but um, they're really lovely people. I mean, some people are kind of angry, but um it's uh, in a you know it's a funny documentary. It's emotional. People you know people find it touching when they mm -hmm. see it and are surprised. Um, you don't have to be a Doctor Who fan in order to enjoy it, but um, I think it helps if you really like Doctor Who. Um, it's like you know my mom enjoyed it, loves it. You know people who don't know anything about Doctor Who have found it to be a fun and touching movie. Um, it's truly an independent film. So the reason why we kind of got our distributor and we're finally going to be out there is um, in May, we got into the London Sci-Fi Film Festival. We won the Audience Award. And then we were in the Melbourne Documentary Film Festival. We got a UK distributor. So we even had a UK theatrical release in, in October of last year. Um, but we're having our American debut um, on March 28th, and it'll be available for digital download, DVD, and Blu-ray. Um, and we just really need the North American Whovians to have, like, you know, a grassroots kind of um, movement, because we would love to have some, you know, theatricals uh, somewhere, and talk to the local cinema and you can, we can, they can play Doctor Who Am I because it's the 60th anniversary. 
So there's like a lot of time between March and, and November for, for kind of more awareness for this documentary to come out. Matt? In the, U in the UK, oh yes, What's that? in the UK, people would they, did, would, do, they did screenings and the screenings were like special screenings where people were able to come and celebrate their fandom. Um, and they and they were they, they you know they weren't big screening there was a, it wasn't like a blockbuster but it was definitely a way of celebrating one's fandom was to come and see this movie in your local cinema um, and they also you know people have been buying the Blu-ray and and they've been downloading it there here this month coming in in February at Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival if you're if any of the listeners here are, are based in Boston. Um, then, then at Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival, um, they're they're using the film. They're using we're we're going over there, and we're it's the opening movie for that festival. Um, and there'll be a um, time travelers ball afterwards in the Crystal Ballroom, um, and then that's on the fifteenth of February. Then on the seventeenth of February, we're showing it to the crowd at Gallifrey. Uh, we're coming back to LA to show it there. Um, and that'll be fun. And then in and then in March, there's the Beloit. Um, am I well, saying that's it right? End of February. The, end, end of February. That's end of February. Um, and that's at the Beloit International Film Festival. Um, and we're still uh, got our fingers a little crossed inside our hearts that maybe Cleveland Festival might say yes, but who knows? That we certainly applied it there, and, and like I'm that. an alum. Yeah. Yeah. Played, all, um, of, all of this is on the wrong side of the border. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just, just saying, we, we do have Canada. cinemas here. Our, our well, well, I've written. Well, that. I've got, well yeah. it'd be great to like. I mean, I'm, we're just trying to figure out how to get the word out there because we we've been, you know, funding this, you know, mostly ourselves, and we need to just get the word out to people to for the pre-sales. Also, um, pre sales will be on iTunes and on Apple Plus TV. So, so prior for about a month prior to March the 28th. Yeah. And we don't have like a mailing list. And one of the 101s, independent filmmaker 101, is have a mailing list. And it's like, oh, we don't have one. So, you know, follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Twitter, but we're definitely, you know, Matthew's a social media wizard. And so, you know, Facebook always has the most of the updates, I would say, or Twitter. Um, I'm just so follow us there. Tell your friends. And um, yeah, we're, and we'll we're thrilled keeping, that it's we'll be, actually going to be seen. <laughs> we'll be pushing it out there once uh, we, we get closer to the pin. So definitely we, we yeah. will do it. And uh, I um, think... Um, did you have one last question, Dave? I do, because okay. I, I will not forgive myself if I don't ask this question. So we we chatted with with Jeremy Raddick, uh, who plays Gareth, the young security guard, yes, who absolutely. eventually saves the world. Yes, of course he does. Was there, this was written as a series. Was he supposed to come back? Because that everything about that scene and that character feels like he was written to come back. I would have liked him to come back. It was It was a case of, of we could put these little characters in. I'm very much a believer in it doesn't matter if somebody's playing a driver of a truck that just passes by, write a name for that character. Make these characters not, they're not, they're not just people who pass through. Um, and that was very much the case with Gareth and with other little characters, the, the cop, um, you know, the, the, any, any, any little character was important. And so, yes, absolutely, he would have come back if, if, um, if, if the if it had if it had ended up going back to San Francisco in some way. I was hoping, you know, and so was, um, you know, and so obviously was Daphne, was that we would continue with her character, even though they part at the end of the TV movie. Um, he would, you know, if it went to series. Um, she would have she would have been brought in, and if she was brought in, then Gig Gareth and you know what I mean, all those people we we done deals with would come back in one way or another. 
Well, we'll go ahead and wrap it up, and I'll show. Uh, I'll run the trailer again, so everybody gets an idea. Again, uh, this is for Doctor Who. Am I the best place to go to? The North American release will be March twenty eighth. I think that's the first day of MegaCon too. If I'm not mistaken. I think it is. Yeah, MegaCon. Yeah. Oh, 30, 30? 30th. Thirtieth. Okay. Thirtieth MegaCon. So, okay, yeah. so it's a, it's roughly around that time. Thirtieth. Right, right there. Yeah. And uh, the best place to go to is Doctor Who Am I dot com uh, for all this and. Um, I can at least uh, attest to this for this. And I've, I've been wanting to say this to you, Matthew, um, for the long, for a while now, after I saw the, uh, I saw the movie, there was one thing I did not see in the movie. And I am, I mean this um, heartfelt. I don't know. It's if about documentary. Movie. Yes. Your documentary. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry that these things happened to you. I'm sorry that, you know, Philip, uh, Philip was, you know, threats like this were happening, and I, I sincerely apologize. I, just seeing it from my end, I was one of those folks who didn't know. Seeing the documentary has made my eyes open wide that things I did not understand, and I think maybe when you got to know the Whovians best, there were things you didn't understand about the us. Yeah. You, you had an understanding. You had your understanding of what Doctor Who is. But I think maybe in in retrospect, you didn't have an understanding of how we felt about Doctor Who. I think and, Vanessa was very aware of that, and more so I, than more than I was. But I think Whovians are very forgiving, and as over time, um, you know, people did like. I loved it. There were just things that we just couldn't swallow at first, and unfortunately, the TV movie also went up against Roseanne Barr's last episode, which is a hard pill to swallow. But um, for what it's worth from the Hooniverse, I'm sorry. And um, I have hope, to apologize, but thank you. I think, but I think welcome. The whole purpose of this podcast when it first started was everybody's opinions were welcome and everybody was part of the Hooniverse. And that I want to live up to that obligation and um, let you know, hey, I'm glad you're part of the family. Thank you. So without further ado, folks, uh, one last time before we end the show. Thank you, Vanessa Yule and, and Matthew Jacobs. Um, thank you. Always check out the TV movie. And uh, March 28th will be the release of Doctor Who Am I will run the trailer for you. Uh, if you two can just stay for just a few moments afterwards so I can get the last messages in there. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining us. Again, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Uh, again, thank you so much for kicking up another thousand in January. Holy cow, you guys are crazy, and I, we love you for it out there. Uh, also, we're on TikTok. If you're into that out there, like, share, and subscribe on the way out. And don't forget to say your goodbyes as you as we leave. And don't forget to youtube.com slash the legend of the traveling TARDIS to subscribe. Thank you all so much for joining us. And one last time, here comes the trailer. <sighs> Melanie, stop praying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Here, goes nothing. Here we that go. One button you're thinking about, Kristen. You got buttons. It. <laughs> oh, like, you got I don't it. want to regard myself as a fan. I'd rather be the one who's worshipped. Worshipped or blamed. I think at the end of the day, probably both. I wrote The Eighth Doctor, played by Paul McGann. It's a bit of a responsibility, I think, that we have. You know, stories are powerful. Mythologies are powerful. My job was to write a TV movie pilot with the hope that it would spawn a new American Doctor Who series. The American fans, they are the diehards. There's a whole community of people that do this. They love this thing that society says you shouldn't love as much as you do. I didn't go to conventions for a very good reason. Be nice. I thought the fans would kill me. The doctor being half human. Please punch me in the face. People universally went after the script. I got physically assaulted by someone who was so angry at the idea that the doctor would kiss. No right sex, please. He's Matthew Jacobs. My father was an actor. He was in an early Doctor Who adventure called The Gunfighters. It'd be fantastic on The Gunfighters because you're going to go back to your boyhood memories. I really don't want to do The Gunfighters panel. It's freaking me out. I was pouring myself into that character. I got so close. And then I got left behind. Maybe I'm regenerating.
Doctor Who has helped a lot of people find who they are. This is a giant family and it's full of love. Woo! The sense of community and companionship. That's what I enjoy the most about. You go for the fans. You're a part of this now. I think in the end of the day, I'm a bigger fan than I knew. At some point or other in our lives, we all ask the same question. Who am I?